Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I hope this episode helps you break your next growth barrier. And if you enjoy it, subscribe to my YouTube channel and you'll never miss a thing. Well, whether it's staffing, budget, volunteers, or one of the many other things that hold church leaders back, overcoming growth barriers is the key to progress. So if you're ready to break your next barrier, the Art of Leadership Academy might be exactly right for you. Inside the Academy, you'll get access to on-demand church leadership courses, team trainings and coaching calls with me. But more importantly, you're gonna join a network of over 1,500 high capacity church leaders. Some will be exactly where you're at, some a little bit ahead, but everybody in the group is committed to leading a healthier, growing church and supporting each other. So if you wanna fuel your mission, not just by consuming more information, but by being in a community with people who will challenge and support you, then today's your day. Learn more and start making progress by visiting theartofleadershipacademy.com. And now to today's episode. Richard, welcome to the podcast. Kerry, it's great to be with you. Yeah. So uh, I imagine a lot of people are very familiar with you and the work of your father and your family, the Blackaby family. Um, but for those who might not be, can you give us a brief primer on sort of, it started with your dad, really, his ministry and his books and, and the global impact of that, and then how it's uh, moved into the next generation and beyond. Yeah, dad was uh, just an ordinary pastor. He's a Canadian, uh, grew up in British Columbia, yeah, yeah. Uh, went to UBC, to university, and, uh, and then went down to San Francisco to go to seminary. That was the first time he'd ever lived in the States. And uh, and he was just, he, he took a church and started pastoring. It was a real down and out church. He turned it around and then he got called to another church that had divided three different ways in uh, Los Angeles. And he turned that around and just kind of doing the usual pastoral thing. You know, you kind of had some of that experience. And, mm -hmm. um, but then uh, he, he, right when things were really going well in his church, he gets called by a little church in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, yeah. They were down to just 10 people. Back then, I mean, Saskatoon was about 100,000 people population, and he's living mm -hmm. in a 6 million population L.A. area, um, yeah. up-and-coming pastor. And when he announced that he was going to leave his church in L.A. and go to Saskatoon, um, move his family of, of seven, uh, people just said he was crazy. Uh, just said, yeah, what, are you what doing? was the, do you know uh, what his motivation was in in that? Well, you know, it's interesting, and it's more of a story, but uh, my parents had gone to kind of a mission conference, and a real renowned missionary statesman was there speaking, and both my parents really felt called to, uh, that God wanted them to to go out and be on mission and be missionaries, and so yeah. they actually went forward as a couple, surrendered to God's missionary call. They applied to their uh, denomination's mission agency, where, where they were accepted, and they were going to be sent to Africa. And I mean, it was all being streamlined. They already had the assignment in place. And then it was kind of bizarre, but I, I was the oldest of their, their kids. I, I passed out. I, I just, about three different times, I just blacked out, fainted. And they took me to the doctor, checked me out, ran all these tests. And the doctor said, we think he has a brain tumor. And I'm like Whoa. six, seven, I'm seven years old at the time. And so they start putting me on really heavy meds to try to keep me from having seizures or anything. And and so the mission agency says, well, you probably don't want your kid going to Africa when he's battling a brain tumor. So we'll just put your file on hold until you get that worked out. And so, so a door has closed on them, basically. But they're all primed to go. I mean, they're ready to go mm -hmm. anywhere in the world God calls them. And so then they get contacted by this little church in Canada. And they said, you know, we're, we don't want to put undue pressure on you. But if you don't come, we're shutting the church down. And so... So my mom and dad said, well, we knew God was getting loosening us up for something, but maybe it's to go back to our own country, to Canada, where, I, where my dad grew up. So we, we end up moving there because I, they thought I had a brain tumor. They get me back to Saskatoon. They take me to doctors so they can continue all these treatments for my brain tumor. And they run all the same battery of tests there in Saskatoon. The doctor says to my parents, your son is perfectly fine. He doesn't have any brain tumor. <sighs> And, um, but by now we're in Canada instead of Africa. And so if I had not fainted about three <laughs> times as a seven-year-old, I would have grown up in Africa, but, uh, that's anyway. unreal. So give me an idea of the timing of that. Uh, but, what year approximately was that? that well, it was 1970 Canada? that we showed up in Saskatoon. Okay. 
And so, so 1970, so Canada, you know, having done, I mean, my story is very similar to your, to your father's Richard, to, to Henry's story. Uh, I went to a church of six people that was yeah. coupled yeah. with a church of 14 people, which was coupled to a church of 23 people. So not even 40, adding them all together. Mm -hmm. And it was like, all right, if this doesn't work, it's going to turn around. And I say that most of the audience to this podcast is American, but Canada was already in a postmodern freefall by 1970. Yeah. Yeah. Mainline churches had peaked already. They were in decline. Evangelical churches got a bit of a boost, but not the kind of boost they got in the United States. And when you yeah. cross the U.S. these days, it's a very similar thing. Lots of churches of 50 hanging on for dear life or 10 yeah. for dear life. So I'm just trying to situate that. So here we yeah. are 50 some odd years later, but the it dynamic was, would be very similar. It was. And, and I mean, it was a beaten up old little building lost in a residential, <laughs> uh, you know, section of town that you couldn't find the church if you, you know, you, you had a bunch of bloodhounds and, and, and uh, the, my dad says uh, kind of charitably, the 10 people left were probably the reason everybody else had left. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, so, and so it was just pretty, pretty uh, dismal. And in fact, there was true. a for sale sign in, on the property when we got there and they had been trying to sell and couldn't, it was such a terrible building. Nobody wanted it. And, and so that's where my dad brought us. Uh, the church had collected $90 in offerings the month before. And, and wow. my dad was so audacious. He actually had the nerve to bring his worship pastor and his family of five with us from California. So we, there was actually 12 of us that showed up in a church that was running 10. Uh, so, you know, when they asked my dad, with, how are things going? He said, we've doubled attendance already. He said, things are going <laughs> great. Uh, but, but 90 uh, bucks the month before. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. So I, I'm sure he had other options. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you so, know, the thing I guess is my parents have reflected on that. They've said, you know, if we had gone with the mission agency to Africa, we would have, it would, we would have been in Africa, but we would have had a whole network of support. I mean, our salaries would be completely covered. We'd have operating expenses, travel expenses, medical care, everything we needed mm -hmm. would be there. And if we were going to attempt a big project, there'd be funding that we could access. But when we went to Canada, there was none of that. The, the, our, our denomination didn't even work in Canada. So they just, we were off the grid. And so basically mm -hmm. they went to a place where all they had was God. And as my parents like to say, we discovered that's all you need. And I don't think he ever would have written Experiencing God if he had been in a place where all of his funding was in place and, you know, his salary was always guaranteed. But I mean, it was a daily thing, whether we're going to eat or not. It was kind of like growing mm -hmm. up in, uh, George Mueller's orphanage where we just kind of waited to see how God would provide this time. And so I think that's why ultimately my dad just learned that God was very practical. I mean, it came right down to feeding your family, showing you what to do, comforting you when there was no one else there. Mm -hmm. The first uh, year we were there, my, my mom actually delivered my, my only sister, the set, the fifth child. And my mom started hemorrhaging, bleeding and uh, oh, no. during a, my dad was at the hospital one night and the, the surgeon came out and said, is there a Mr. Black could be here in the room? And he identified himself and the, the surgeon came over and said, Mr. Black could be, we can't stop your wife's bleeding. They said, we, we've done everything. We can't stop it. We don't know what else to do. They said, if, if it doesn't stop soon, we're, she won't make it to the, till tomorrow. And so my dad is sitting there. He's brought his family. He's got five kids now and he's about to be a widower. And not one person in the, of the 10 in that church is even there with him in the waiting room. He's going to find out if he's a widower that night. And he's traveled 1,800 miles to get there to, to serve this church. And, and no one has driven five miles just to sit through the night with him in the hospital. And in, in that point, I, I asked my dad later, I said, what happened? He said, I, all I had was God. And he said, I just cried out, said, God, if I made the biggest mistake of my life, I dragged my American wife all the way to Saskatoon so she could die here far from family and friends and leave me with five kids. And, and, and he just said, God just filled that, that waiting room in that moment. He was so real, so tangible. You, you could feel the presence of God in that room. And it was as if God just said, I don't make mistakes. You've been faithful. You're right where I want you to be. Just hold on. It'll be okay. And the next morning, the, the surgeon came out to my dad, said, Mr. Blackaby, we can't explain it, but the bleeding just stopped. We, did, we didn't do a thing. It just stopped. And 
she, he said she was hemorrhaging and all of a sudden it just stopped. She, he, and my dad said, I knew it would. It, <laughs> the surgeon said, well, how, how did you know? He said, well, God told me. And the surgeon looked at my dad kind of funny and said, well, he's the only one who would have known <laughs> because, oh, wow. uh, and so that from that, my dad just, just practiced that, that God was real and God would guide him. God would provide. And, and so people began asking him to, um, to just to tell them, like, how is God, why is God so real to you? Like you talk about him as if he's a person, as if he actually like relates to you, like that he, he, he provides for you. Like that's not our experience. And ultimately a publisher heard my dad just talking about it one day and they approached him and said, Henry, we've never heard anybody describe a, a relationship with God like this. Um, we need you to put it in a book. And my dad just couldn't do it. He just, he said, I've never written. I'm too busy. You don't know how. They, they hounded him. I mean, they just followed him along, said, you got something in you that the world needs to have. They finally assigned one of their editors uh, to, they just said, follow him around and, and just record everything he says, <laughs> <Take some laughs> everywhere <notes>. he teaches. <laughs> and they literally took the manuscript, of, the transcript of him teaching in live audiences and, and put that into a, a manuscript that dad ultimately worked with. And it became a wildly best-selling book um, that has changed people's lives all around the world. And, and it's, it just almost never happened. And it was, my dad was not an author looking to write a book. He was, he was just busy trying to keep up with God and somehow they got it in writing. And literally I can't, I can go to, I've been in mainland China. I've been in Cuba. I've been in, in Muslim countries. I have yet to go anywhere in the world where people have not come up and told me that that book has changed their life. Do you know how many copies of Experiencing God have been sold right now? Well, you know, it's, the, the, I get lots of numbers. It, it, there's a workbook that has sold over 8 million copies, um, but that's just wow. in English. It's in 75 to 80 other languages, and they have no idea. There's no way to track that. And so, it gets you know, eight, yeah. and, and then that's the workbook. There's a trade book version as well that has sold just just oodles of, of books as well. So it's but millions and millions. Of yeah, yeah. So yeah. millions and millions yeah. for a guy that yeah. was just in Canada, a church of 10 trying to just be faithful in a very, very hard place. What happened? How long were you as a family at that church? What happened to that church in the years that followed? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, he was, he was there at that church. It's called faith Baptist uh, for yeah. uh, 12 years. And then, he moved over to be a denominational leader to kind of help lots of churches do that. And, and um, sadly the, they called another pastor who was the, you know, a lot, there's, there's a lot of harebrained kind of uh, common wisdom around churches. And one of them is, you know, w when you get a, another pastor, get someone who's the opposite of the last one. <laughs> and that's just crazy, crazy thinking. And, you know, the, your whole church is wired to respond positively to one form of leadership. And then you bring in a leader who's the exact opposite. And I, it, it's in lots of manuals, but it's crazy, crazy thinking. And so they brought someone in who didn't walk by faith, who, who didn't. My dad's philosophy was, if you save your life, you'll lose it. So just keep giving your life away to the kingdom of God. And so we would start missions. We, we started 38 missions uh, in the 12 years dad was there. And when the, when his successor came, he said, you can't keep giving yourself away like this. We, you, you'll go broke. We, you got to, let's build up the base. Let's get bigger at the home home front. And that killed the church, basically. It, it, the church is still there, but it that he basically shut down so much of what my dad had done. And just an example, the worst kind of pastoral succession you could possibly have. Oh, uh, that's so hard. Pastoral succession is a real challenge. So your dad did see some growth and 38, when you say 38 missions, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, a lot of those became churches out in other towns all over the province. Some were always just kind of Bible studies that went on for years, uh, you know, community-wide Bible studies. But but every week there was a, a ministry going on in 38 different towns. Many Many of those became churches that actually started lots of churches themselves. Um, and so from a church of 10 that had a for sale sign in front, I got to see the difference it makes. And you, you've seen this as well. I know from your background of, you know, when everyone else says it's impossible, you know, this oh, yeah. people just don't, aren't interested in God in this community. This is a hard community. And then someone mm -hmm. else comes in and all of a sudden you can't get enough chairs to sit everybody down in. And, 
it's like, well, what? It's the same God was here, but with the last guy, you know, the same God is over. <laughs> yep. It's the same community. Why is it that all of a sudden everybody's so responsive? Uh, could it be that it's just this person actually believed that with God all things were possible? No, it's true. We we heard every excuse in the book about why it wouldn't work, why it wouldn't grow, why it was a waste of time, and it just it's just not true. It's just yeah. not true. But I'll tell you, I've lived you know Canada in the U.S. and it is. For our American listeners here, it is harder to grow a church, and so in Canada, and so what you did yeah. north of Toronto, that's not that was no easy feat. Well, what God did, I mean, yeah. I got I was in the way quite a bit. It would be interesting to see what would happen if God actually, you know, had 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 full uh, reign, and yet, you know, He uses very broken people to accomplish His yeah. purposes, which is extraordinary. Extraordinary. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to talk a lot about your ministry and your legacy, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I want to talk a little bit more about your parents. How yeah. did your dad go from, you know, that local pastor? And then, you know, lots of people publish a book, it sells 500 copies, 1,000 copies, and they go back to work the next day and it's over. Mm -hmm. But that was not your dad's story. How did no. he handle the transition? as things became more global and more universal in his ministry? You know, my dad is a very humble, ordinary, very introverted uh, Canadian. Mm -hmm. And he was just constantly caught by surprise. Uh, he just never, <laughs> he never aspired for anything. Like he never, yeah. he didn't yeah. aspire to be an author, didn't aspire to be a, a speaker. But, but the phone would just keep ringing. <laughs> and he, his, you know, part of what he taught was, God's always up to something and he's looking for someone that he can have join him. And when God calls me up, I'm just going to say, yes, it's, uh, it'll, it may mm. scare me to death. It may seem impossible, but I'm just going to keep saying yes. And so, you know, the, just stuff started happening for dad. And, uh, and I mean, you know, I, I remember he'd call one day and he'd say, you never guessed today, Richard, we got a call from the White House. The president invited me to come to the Oval Office, you know, <laughs> he's, and like, oh, I'm, Richard, you, next, you know, I just got a call. Where I'm, I'm going to be speaking to the ambassadors in, in the United Nations. And can you believe that? Like just us, you know, and um, he got involved with, with CEOs of Fortune 20 companies, Fortune 100 companies. And here's a guy that, you know, had, had, had never had much money and, and basically led smaller churches for the most part. And he's got CEOs of Fortune 10 companies uh, asking to be discipled by him. And I mean, he, he just went around, he was in, I think, 115 different countries. And if you looked, you just say, well, why does stuff keep happening to him? Like, why does he keep getting invited? <clears throat> and I don't, you know, and and you can look and say, well, there's lots of people more talented than my dad. Uh, there's lots of people, better communicators, better organized, uh, better use of uh, technology, uh, better administrative skills. But it just, there just wasn't a week that went by that he did something, God wasn't doing something. And I just watched that. I, I, I had a front row seat to say, so why does God use him? Like, there's lots of people that I and would say are more talented. That? What's well, your take on that? You know, I, I've said to people, because one time I was, uh, I was speaking at a meeting and this guy came up to me and he, seen, he was kind of a brash, kind of loud, outspoken pastor uh, from Texas. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, you know, your dad wrote Experiencing God. He said, uh, you know, I could have written that book. <laughs> and uh, he said, I know all that stuff. So I've been saying all that stuff for years. And, but, he, you know, he just had a kind of arrogant tone to him. And uh -huh. so I just said, I don't know. I, he sort of got to me. So I, I said, well, yeah. why didn't you write it? And, and he it kind of took him back for a moment. And I said, you know why I think my dad wrote that book? I said, because I think God had a really important message he wanted to bless the church with. So he looked for the most humble, unassuming man he could find that would never take the credit for it. It would never go to his head. He'd give all the glory to God. And he found my dad and he used him wow. and uh, all the glory to God for it. <laughs> That's a good parable. What else did you learn from your dad uh, over the years? What what have you learned from him? Well, just that God's a person. God's not mm -hmm. just a doctrine. I see a lot mm -hmm. of Christians who treat God like he's a doctrine, mm -hmm. like a belief system or a worldview. Uh, he's a person, and and God and Dad taught me just treat him as a person. I mean, he's a person that actually wants to relate to you. You don't have to wait to heaven to start interacting with this person. The moment you become a Christian, the Spirit of God enters your life, 
and he's ready to let's go. I, I got stuff mm. for you to do. Uh, and my dad just believed it. And so every day my dad got up and said, okay, God, what are we doing today? And, uh, and my dad had a very high view of God. Uh, I mean, mm. my dad honestly believed that with God, all things were possible. So he could stand in front of 20 people in the church building. And if you just listen to him preach, if you didn't look around and see the sparseness of that room, you'd think he must be preaching in a mega church because, I mean, he just mm. talked about God being so awesome and so powerful. And you're looking at him and say, well, if he's so powerful, why, you know, where is everybody? Why is this building so dumpy? Uh, but over time, you just watched what happened and over and over again, stuff would happen that you just couldn't explain if it wasn't that Almighty God was just pleased to step in once again. Your dad rose up in a really interesting generation. He would be similar contemporary to Dallas Willard or Eugene Peterson, et cetera, uh, Elizabeth Elliot, et cetera. And you look at people from that generation and they had massive influence in their lives, but never, I think you can make a solid argument, never sought to create a platform. Yeah. Now we live in an age where everybody wants a platform. Everyone's yeah. trying to build one. There may not be anything to offer once you built that platform. <laughs> yeah. uh, I still find it curious that a lot of people who ended up with platforms never set out to build one in this yeah. day. But, but your dad in particular... That was a really unique generation. And people like Dallas Willard and even Eugene Peterson were almost indifferent to mm -hmm. the influence they had. They stewarded it. I'm not saying they didn't care, but it's not like, oh yeah, look at me. I knew this was my plan and my eight step plan was gonna get me here. <laughs> yeah. um, what, what does this generation particularly think about you know, your kids or grandkids, Richard? What yeah. do they need to know from your parents' generation that we've kind of lost? Yeah, it's a different time. And you're right. I was around a mm -hmm. bunch, like Bill Bright of Campus Crusades, another one that my dad was friends yeah. with. And a lot of guys like that were just world world changers. But you got around them. You know, I'd have, I'd, I'd, my dad would have me join these guys and have dinner or something. And I'd just listen to them talk. And uh, there was a humility. They, they were just overwhelmed, really, by the presence of God. It was like, Almighty God just put his hand on my life. And I, it's just, I'm trembling at the, the awesomeness of this. And I just don't want to mess this up. And there was an overwhelming sense of the magnitude that, and, and you know, people used, my dad used to say, has anyone here uh, had God give them a small assignment? And, you know, people would raise their hand and he'd say, wait a minute, if God gave it to you, it's not a small assignment. You, you measure <laughs> you, you measure the size of the assignment, the worth of the assignment by who gave it to you. And if Almighty God gave you anything to do, it's far more than you deserve. And, and that's the way those guys treated it was like whether I'm just preaching to a church of 30 people or 30,000 people, God's the one who orchestrated this. And so I, I do it with trembling and fear and reverence that I, I do it well to the glory of God. And, and you're right now. And I, I guess the thing I'd say in terms of writing was my dad had a message, you know, and um, it, you're, you're right. You can have the greatest platform in the world, but if you don't have a, a message, that, that's where the power was. And when dad wrote Experiencing God, the, the publisher actually, I think printed 5,000 copies and they were hoping they'd sell all of them. Uh, and then they just started, they just started, they couldn't print it fast enough. In fact, in last uh, November, just a, you know, a couple months ago, last year, um, they, they were, the printer was running out of the book still. And that's 32 years later, they were running out. They couldn't print them fast <laughs> enough. And, and it's like, well, and the, and so they said, well, this was horribly marketed. I mean, it wasn't marketed when it first came out. Why did it sell so well? And you just said, because it, it, it had, it was truth and it was life-changing mm -hmm. truth. And mm -hmm. people started having their life change and they started telling everybody about it. And you didn't need them. I mean, the best marketing campaign in the world is just word of mouth by very satisfied yeah. customers. Yeah. Yeah. Your mom passed away recently and I'm so yeah. sorry for your loss with that. And uh, I read a tribute you paid to her. Can you tell us what you learned from your mom? You know, she was the unsung hero, you know, she, my dad was the, the exalted, revered man of God. My mom was the troops on the ground. I, the way we describe it is my, my dad was parliament and my mom was the RCMP, you know, she kept, okay, yeah, yeah, she the, kept the five force. kids in, in line. 
uh, dad passed the laws, but mom enforced them. And, uh, <laughs> but she, you know, the things we learned from her was one was just an enthusiasm. Uh, she, I, 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 I so appreciate that now she just said, whatever you're doing, be all in. You know, I know we're a dumpy little church with a handful of people, but get in there and make it fun. You know, I know you're the only teenagers in the whole church, but you can have an awesome youth group if you just kind of embrace it and, you know, are all in. And and so whatever we were, wherever we were, whatever we had, we, we had the smallest house probably on our street. But mm-hmm. I, you just heard laughter coming out of our house all the time. In fact, there was a time, it's kind of a famous story, that my parents were at a family wedding somewhere, and my parents had gotten a motel somewhere. They were going to stay during the wedding. They were from out of town. And another, some relatives came. They knew that they knew the motel my parents were staying in, but it was quite an expansive one, a lot of wings here and there and so on. And But they couldn't, They it was they didn't have their, they didn't have cell phones, I don't think, then. And so they, and the front desk wouldn't tell them what room my parents were in. So they were like, well, how are we going to find them? This, this, this motel's got hundreds and hundreds of rooms. And they, and one of them said to the other, literally, let's just walk around and listen for laughter. And when mm-hmm. we hear the laughing, we'll find them. And sure enough, my mother had this laugh that you could, it would just carried for blocks. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, they found my parents' room. They went and knocked, heard the laughing, traced it to a door, knocked on it. There's my parents. And and so, I mean, we had nothing. We, we I grew up poor, really, a poor mission pastor's uh, family, grew up with hand-me-downs. But I'll tell you what, our home was characterized by joy and I an enthusiasm for life and an enthusiasm for serving God. And I think that's really why all five kids in my family, 40 years ago, all five of us went into full-time ministry. And interestingly, 40 years later, all five are still in full-time ministry. Not one is left, all five still in. That's incredible. And now all three of my kids are in full-time service as well. And, uh, and I, I think it, I trace a lot of that back to her and my dad, but just, a, 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 and it wasn't that they had it easy. It wasn't that they never got treated poorly, uh, but they just had such an enthusiasm, uh, really a sense of being overwhelmed that God would use them. And they, they just never lost the wonder of being called mm-hmm. by God to do anything. Yeah, you hope you never lose that, right? That that sense of awe and wonder. You you also write that your family was far from perfect. So what were some of the, God bless you, <laughs> what were some of the, the tensions? Because we often idolize our heroes and say, well, that family had no challenges. But as far as you're comfortable sharing, what were some of the, the tensions, the struggles that your family faced when you were growing up or your parents faced? Well, you know, I, I'm a, I've got a PhD in history. I love history. I love, biographies are my favorite kind of book to read. I've got lots and lots of them. But what I love about biographies, about even the greatest of, of historic figures, is that they all have feet of clay. You know, they're, you, you yeah. never have to dig yeah. very far until you find that they're human like everybody else. And, mm-hmm. I, and I, even with Christian leaders, you know, church leaders, and, and I know for a lot of people that discourages them. As soon as they find out that they're flawed humans, it's like, oh, there goes my faith, you know. They're, they're not perfect either. It's like, no, it actually, that gives me more faith because mm-hmm. if they were a perfect human being that never made mistakes, I mean, how big of a deal would their Christianity be? But, but God came and took this flawed, frail, you know, person, like with all kinds of baggage and still did an amazing thing in their life. And so... So that was my my family. I mean, um, my dad. You know, a lot of things that, that makes a leader very successful is also their weak their weakness. You know, it's just a thin line sometimes between what your your strength is and what your weakness is. And so, like my dad, uh, wh- wh- something that made him really good was that he was the biggest optimist I've ever seen. My my dad mm-hmm. used to say, "How can you see God sitting on His throne and not be and you not be an optimist?" I mean, how, he's, he would say, "There are no That's pessimists crazy. in heaven." I can promise you, when you're in heaven and you see God, you're the, you can't be a pessimist. But he so he said so he was the biggest optimist I ever knew. But the problem is. He saw everything positively. And, you know, sometimes there were problems. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, you know, he'd have someone that was struggling, or, and, but he would just see the potential. And I, well, I'd say, well, he, I know he's got potential, but he's got some major issues that yeah. need addressing, you know. And so, and so he'd see his family that way. And, and there would be times, I mean, in one sense, his head would be in the heavenlies. And my mother was always the one that had her feet on the ground, you know. And so there were right. times where 
I, I remember one time early on moving to Canada, some, we, my, my brothers had built this little fort in our backyard. We we're just playing in our backyard and these neighborhood ruffians had broken into our backyard and were trying to destroy this fort. Mm -hmm. So I heard this banging around in our backyard. I went running out and I chased these kids out of our yard and threw them out the yard. Well, those kids um, got their teenage older brother to, to, intercept me after school one day and beat the tar out of me because oh, I, no. because I chased them out of my yard when they were destroying my property. Uh, it seemed pretty unjust to me. And I remember coming home just so angry that I'd been this teenage yeah. kid. Like I'm, I'm in seventh, well, fifth grade being beat up by mm -hmm. a teenage kid. But, and I remember coming in and my dad had been going like crazy, was exhausted. He was actually lying down, just resting on the bed before going out that evening. And I'm just so furious. And I came in, I told my dad what was going on. And the last thing he wanted to do is walk down the street and confront a neighbor about the fact his teenager had beat up his little boy. And so he's kind of giving me an inspirational talk about turning the other cheek <laughs> and <laughs> honoring God and being salt and light in our neighborhood. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to hear at that point, you know, I, I really wanted my dad to at least anguish with me over the injustice of what I'd experienced and I remember walking out that his door that day saying, that's the last time I'm going to tell dad about a fight at school I have. Like it's, I'm going to have to deal with this on my own. And so, you know, there were things, but I, you know, I, I knew that he loved God. That didn't really ever cause me to, you know, resent him. Or I, I just realized he had a really high calling from God. And there are just some things that other dads would have probably marched right down the street and, you know, pounded on the door and said, you Sorted keep your out. kid away from mine. Or, Dad was never in a million years going to do that. I knew that. And so I just had to accept the fact, okay, I, you know, he's, he is all in with God and, and he would, you know, he was of that generation where right in the middle of a family dinner, if the phone rang, he was going to go answer it and we might not see him again, you know, cause he'd be counseling somebody all through our mealtime. It just didn't cross his mind, you know, to just let it ring and check later, you know, uh, he was a pastor on call. And so he had, he did some things I think that were just kind of generational that he didn't know any better, but I somehow just knew that he, he loved me anyway. That's just how he operated. And so, yeah, there were things, I, I, every one of us kids, uh, there's no one that if you asked any of my siblings, who's the greatest man of God, you know, we'd all say my dad. But yeah, if you yeah. said, are you, is your goal to parent just like him? We'd all say no. We all no. plan to do major upgrades, uh, you know. So I know some homes where that's not worked out well. The the pain and disappointment of bad parenting has turned people away from God. And I, I feel the grace of God, I think. Uh, none of us turn from God. We just realize, well, when we raise our kids, we'll try to do better on some things. So, you know, in light of that, you, you, you're carrying on your father's legacy. You have your own, you've written dozens of books and you have your own ministry to corporate leaders, uh, some church leaders, et cetera, et cetera. But carrying on the family business, this is something I hear more and more, lots of parent-child transitions going on at churches, also in the business world. Can you talk about that? Because some of, like, what are the dynamics involved? Sometimes children want to distinguish themselves from their parents or get their own identity. How has that journey been for you, Richard? Yeah, you know, my, my style is very different than my dad's. And I, I would yeah. never forget um, when I was kind of young, starting out, uh, I, I was speaking at a church in Texas. And literally two years before that, my dad had spoken in that same church. And I mean, the glory of God had fallen. And I mean, two years later, they're still talking about it in hushed tones, you know, the, the greatest day that they'd ever seen in that church. And so now his son, his oldest son is coming, you know, oh, good, another Blackaby. And so I preached my heart out. And then they, the pastor had me stand at the front and invite people to come by and talk to me. And this older lady walked by and took my hand and said, well, son, you're good, but you're not your dad. <laughs> and, oh, and so nice. you, you know, you, you may have nice. been blessed that way too at times. And, um, and so yeah. I just said, well, ma'am, um, you know what? I said, uh, I, I certainly appreciate your prayers that I could one day even be half the man of God that my dad is. But I said, but would you like to know a secret about my dad? I said, when he was my age, he wasn't my dad either. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I just said, you know, give me a chance. He's 26 years older than me. I've got, I've got yeah. some time I, I, I need to make up. But 
So, you know, when, how do you follow someone that, I mean, thousands of people would say he was the greatest man of God they knew. And, and mm-hmm. then you, you mm-hmm. succeed him, you know? Um, and so I, you, what I would say to anybody following a, a successful leader, I've, I, I talk a lot about leadership and I'll ask people, would you rather follow a successful leader or a failure of a leader? <laughs> and um, a lot of people say, yeah, I'd love to follow a bad leader because then whatever I do is going to, you know, has to look better than what he did. But, but I would say, no, I'd rather follow a great leader. Um, but w- what you want to be, you, but you have to, you have to, you can't be insecure. The, mm. And I, I'll just tell you, there's a lot, there's a lot of insecure leaders out there who feel threatened mm-hmm. by the success of their predecessor. And you just, you got to get over that. And you have to realize this isn't about me. This is not mm-hmm. my organization. It's not about my leadership. I'm just a steward of this organization for a time. And then I'm going to hand it on to someone else. You know, I think I heard you say the other day, uh, for pastors, we're all interim pastors. We're all, you, yeah. you, you, there's, there's someone coming after you. There was someone before you. And so while you're there, don't let it be about you. Let it be about the organization. And, and so I always just said, and every, everything I've ever led, I've taken an inventory. What was given to me the first day I walked in the door? Like how many staff did I have? Where, how, how in debt were we? What, you know, what was our attendance, whatever. And then the day I handed it off to the next guy, what did I give him? How many more staff mm-hmm. did I hand to him? You know, are the, all the, 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 the debts were all paid at, when I left and, you know, we, we owed nothing. And so I, it's about the organization. And so, you know, for me to follow a great man who's my dad, I just thought I, I, what I need to trust and, and respect are his values, what his principal teachings that revolutionize people's lives and walk with God I certainly don't want to mess those up because those mm-hmm. God has been pleased to use those. But Dad was terrible at technology. I mean, he could barely send an email. You know, if his life depended yeah. on it. And so, uh, can we modernize technology and delivery systems and marketing and stuff? Yeah, there's lots of stuff we can, you know, do better. But this, but but notice when you get to the gold, the 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 treasure, the what is it that makes this organization special? Like, just be very careful about touching that. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you, then you start messing things up and you kill the, the gold, the, the goose that lays the gold egg. So, uh, so modernize stuff, upgrade things. But, uh, I was always very careful to as, as carefully as I could to continue to share the message, just perhaps to a younger generation, uh, with better technology, but, um, but, and there's no point in trying to be who you're not, you know, I, I've got some brothers and, and siblings, I think that maybe preach more like my dad does than I do. It just wasn't my style. And so it wouldn't have worked if I just tried to preach like my dad or whatever. So I, I just had to be me and, uh, but God's blessed, you know, our today, the ministry is doing more than it's ever has, you know, but but the message keeps going on. The stuff my, that God showed my dad, we, we, we keep packaging it in modern packaging, but uh, it's the same message. Mm. You mentioned insecurity, Richard. Yeah. Has that been, was that a struggle for you? Or are you just naturally born more secure? I, I think you're right. A lot of leaders struggle with insecurity. Oh, Definitely yeah. been a battle in my life. What, what was that like for you? Well, you know, it's funny because like all five of my dad's kids, my, my mom and dad, they are all in ministry. And so people would say, you must have been pressured into that. You know, you must have had a lot of expectations to follow the family business. It was actually just the opposite. Like the first time I ever talked to my dad about being in ministry was the day I walked up in an altar call at our church and said, dad, I think God's calling me into ministry. And dad was like, I've always known that. I, I, I said, well, if you've always known that, why didn't you tell me? You might have saved you some rough years in my teenage years. And, and he said, well, I wanted you to hear it from God first. And, um, wow. but what I would say is it, interestingly, like my dad, his dad was a Brit from, I mean, my, my, my grandfather, Black could be fought in world war one was in the trenches, uh, in most of the major battles uh, of World War One, it was uh, he. He'd come. He was born in London. Was uh, a British guy and tough. Um, but you know, one of those kind of stiff uh, Brits that didn't really quite. I mean, he loved you. You had no doubt about that. But he might never tell you that. And 
you, you'd have to read between the lines. It just was real awkward to like commend you. So, so that's how my dad was raised. And so my dad, I'm sure is a lot better than my, his dad was, mm -hmm. but like, I, I, I'll just say this. The first three times that my dad ever heard me preach in a church, uh, like I, first time I was in university still, uh, the next time he heard me, I was in seminary. The next time I was in my first church. All three times he heard me preach, he said something afterward that deeply hurt my feelings. <laughs> mm. And I mean, he wasn't trying to, he wasn't trying to be unkind, but he just, he would say something like in retrospect, you'd shake your head and say, you said what? Like you mm. you just heard your son preach his first sermon and that's what you said to him? And I mean, it was just deeply, deeply hurtful, especially the last time. Mm. And because uh, now I'm a pastor and I'm thinking, I finally, you know, I've got, I know what I'm doing. And then he just said a very, I don't like where, I don't know where his head was, but, but I remember just kind of going away and saying, I gotta, I gotta decide this right now. Like I'm not, if I'm doing this to please my dad, <laughs> it's not working. Mm. Uh, I, mm. The only reason I should be doing this is because I know God wants me to. And I, I just can't, if, if I'm going to do it based on people's approval and appreciation and expressions of thanks, I got to get out of this line of work because I'm, uh, and point. I remember just getting on my knees and saying, you know what, if nobody thanks me, if no one appreciates me, I'm only doing this because God, you want me to do it. So I just, I just need to get all my feelings and ego and put it on the altar and get rid of it and say, uh, you know, when someone criticizes me, I can say, yeah, you know what? That's the half of it. <laughs> I could tell you a lot mm. more, but isn't it amazing? God uses someone like me. And so I, I, I think I would have had a lot of tendencies to, I, I did struggle with insecurity growing up. And at a certain sure. point, I just thought this, this insecurity is going to eat me alive if I don't yeah. just deal with it. I just, I, it's like this dragon that wants to keep raising its ugly head. And I, I've been, I mean, I love pastors. I've been around them all my life, but I, I mean, I, I know pastors of huge churches that are just, they almost beg you to affirm them and tell them how great they are. And it's like, why do you, why do you even need that? Like, obviously you're a talented guy, you, but I mean, it's, I mean, they're like, they're just begging you to just tell them what wonderful mm -hmm. people they are. And it's like, why do you need that? Like, is God's approval enough? I mean, you just look in the mirror and say, hey, I, to the best of my ability, I did what God called me to do. I, that's all I've got. Uh, it's got to be good enough. But, but boy, there's a lot of that. And insecurity will cause you to do some really, really destructive things. And I just had to get free from that because I didn't want to hurt anybody. And I certainly didn't want to hurt my church because I, I started making everything about me and my sensitive feelings. Yeah, ironically, when you're insecure, it becomes all about you. It's true. Yeah. It really does. And it's well, hard to help build something stronger when you keep thinking about yourself all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very true. Um, I want to talk about experiencing God. So yeah. it is a message that has gotten out to millions. You've worked with your dad on that message over the years. Uh, what are some, because everybody, I think, even agnostics would love to experience God. Yeah. Christians would love to experience God. It, but I think it wouldn't be all that different than your father's day when he would go into a church and it's like, well, we've never experienced God like that. Yeah. What, what are some of the distinctives um, that you think this generation is missing when it comes to experiencing God? Well, you know, the interesting thing is like my dad's his generation wrote experiencing God, but I think the things that it highlights are very applicable to the younger generation right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone's looking for authenticity. They don't want just formal dead religion. They want something that's real. Like, don't just tell me, here's the things you need to believe. Um, here's the moral practices you need to follow. Um, what experiencing God says is, let me introduce you to a person that loves you beyond anything you could imagine who is there for you, who knows the future, who wants to guide you into uh, abundant life, who has a purpose for your life. You're not an accident on this planet. God puts you here at this time, at this place, because he has a purpose, and he wants you to discover what that purpose is. And so, you know, I the, the things that people have said most about experiencing God is that, well, one is, is it, the, the subtitle is Knowing and Doing the Will of God. And, you know, my dad, actually, we when he was a pastor, he, he started reaching a lot of university students and that was their number one question was, you know, how do I know God's will to, should I major well, that was in my this? my next question because it is related, right? Yeah. yeah experiencing it's like, God. so how do I know his will? And so they, 
Um, and my dad always said, if you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. And mm-hmm. he said, you know, it, don't ask what is God's will for my life. That's a very self-centered question. He would say, ask what is God's will. That's a God-centered mm-hmm. question. And he, he was mm-hmm. always redirecting us. He would say, don't be a self-centered Christian, be a God-centered one. And so he'd say, now, the, a lot of Christians think, well, it's just all about me. And so God must have these massive file cabinets in heaven with all these files on everybody's life that and all the things he wants for them to do and experience and all the happy days he's scheduling for them day after day and, and like a, 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 a cosmic a cruise ship entertainment director or something. And dad would say, that's the wrong, that's the wrong perspective. It's what is God doing? God has, he's had eternal purposes. He's working out every day on this planet around us. And that's, you know, we don't invite God to join us in what we're doing, which is what we pray a lot is God, I'm going to try this here. And I really would ask you to bless this, help this be successful. He said, stop doing that. Ask God, what are you doing in my children's lives, in my workplace, mm-hmm. uh, in the ministry you gave me, in my life? And and then once I know what you're doing, let me adjust my life and join you. And now g- get in the center of what you're doing. And now I'm a part of a God thing. We, we keep wanting God to be a part of a Richard thing. <laughs> and, and God's <laughs> like, that's way too small for me. I want Richard to be a part of a God thing. And so, you know, I, I've had some crazy, crazy um, comments, you know, people will, they'll push back and it's typically people who've never experienced God themselves. And so they don't really know what they're, they're critiquing even, but Mm -hmm. they'll say Mm -hmm. things like, um, well, I mean, do you have to like pray to know, like, should I buy Crest toothpaste or Colgate toothpaste, you know, like, and I'd say if, if God's purposes on earth are hinging on whether you get Crest toothpaste on your teeth instead of Colgate. Yeah, you do. But there's a whole lot of stuff. It just doesn't really matter in the in the in the purposes of God. God's worried about redemption, about restoring broken humanity, about setting people free. That's what He cares about. So, um, it what you know whether you, you do you have to pray over whether to order the chicken or the beef for your entree at lunch today. Probably not. I know a bunch of super spiritual people that want to pray about everything as if God really cares what kind of meat choice they had today. But, but then there's other times where God really does care about some really my, you know, minor, seemingly minor details. Like I, I've got a CEO I worked with several years ago, and he was going to go on a business trip. He had to fly out uh, that, that morning, goes into his closet to get dressed. He's going to put on a suit and tie. He, he normally goes to his power tie he's going to use for this big uh, sales presentation. But, um, but he sees his alumni tie from the university he graduated from years before. And he, he never wears that for business. Like that's what you wear at a reunion, you know, but something just tells him he should put that tie on. He's like, what if, what if the customer went to, in a, you know, in a, a rival school? Like maybe this will kill the sale. Like I, it'd be foolish to like identify myself with, you know, the university I went to, but he can't get away from it. So he actually puts it on and he actually brings a power tie with him, sticks it in his pocket in case he, he comes to a census and he needs his trust, reliable power tie gets to the airport, sits down, is waiting for uh, to board, and he's got a bit of time. He got there early, and a total stranger comes up to him, says, hey, did you go to that school? That's where I went. And they start into a conversation. They end up having this gospel conversation, and he shares Christ with this man, and the guy's in tears, and he prays with this total stranger before they go on. And, and, and afterward, he says, you know, like, did it matter what tie I wore that day? I think it did. I, know. I think God actually cared. Now, most days he does it. I don't think you need to agonize in your closet every day about what tie to, to wear, what shirt should I wear. That's just kind of silliness. But but the the key is, but the spirit of God within you, if you just learn to to be sensitive to his promptings. And he knows if it matters this day, whether you go to that restaurant or that restaurant, whether you talk to that waitress or not, you know, what you wear this tie or that tie. And so what my dad just taught is Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with a person. And the moment you, you're saved, uh, the Spirit of God, who is God, enters into your life. And he's not a silent partner. He doesn't just sit there for the rest of your mm-hmm. life on earth saying, oh, boy, that's going to hurt. You know, <laughs> boy, yeah, he yeah, shouldn't yeah. do that. You know, he, uh, the Spirit of God is, Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send another helper who's going to be just like me. He's going to he's going to guide you just like I guided you, um, and he'll be invisible. He'll be inside you, but he will be just as active in your life if you will listen to him. 
And so, so many people have said to us, they'll say, you know, before I took experience in God, I, I, I was religious, but I had no idea God wanted to be that engaged in my life, that he was that involved, that he cared, that he, he, he wanted to walk with me each day. And uh, it is, they, they'll say, it was like my, my whole Christian life was in black and white before, and now it's in HD color. Uh, mm-hmm. I realize there's just so much more than what I've been experiencing all my life. You know, understanding God's will is a really interesting thing, and I can relate to sort of the macro decisions. Does God really care what you're having for dinner? I mean, there's good stewardship of the body if you're eating, yeah. you know, yeah. chips and ice cream three times a day. You should probably <laughs> rethink that, right? But, you know, does he really care about X or Y? And yet, you know, I haven't had a Thai story, but I can think of other things where I felt a prompting, like you should go here or you should do this, and you go there, yeah. and then something amazing happens. Um, but you know, there is, then there are other times where I think God really, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. You know, did I really pray about the law school I was going to go into? Sort of. I think at that time I was, I was starting to give my life back to Christ, but at a law school came my wife and, you know, you yeah. look at the odds of that. Or for example, if you hadn't had those phantom uh, fainting spells, uh, your dad could have gone to Africa with your whole family and experiencing God may not have been written. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where you try to trace it out. So day to day, like in your life and for people, for leaders who are trying to figure out God's will for their life, where's the line? Do you pray about it all? Or how do you, how do you know it's a prompting? And I know this is a whole other podcast, but I'd love yeah. just the encapsulated version yeah. of like, how specific do you get? Because I agree. Sometimes it seems very macro and there's nothing. And other times it gets so micro that you're like, okay, I think God might've been in that. Yeah, you know, and you're right. There's, in fact, the most controversial uh, thing that we've faced, the most pushback we've had of all the things we teach is that God speaks to people. I tell you, and that's mm-hmm. not, we don't get pushback from atheists. We get pushback from Christians, uh, Christian leaders. And, like God doesn't speak anymore. Yeah, he's and it's Bible, like, no, I want to say, give me the verse where it, God says he's not speaking anymore. You know, like right. the, if you if you look at the Bible, he's speaking from one end to the other of it. And it's the only manual we have, you know, but, but what people will say is, well, we don't need the, we don't need the spirit of God to speak anymore. We got the book now. And I'd say, well, God didn't save you to, to bring you into a relationship with a book. He brought you into a relationship mm. with himself. Now, the book is his word. I want to minimize yeah, the yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a it's a book. You're he he's a person. You relate you relate to a person. And I know people that just love doctrine. It's just it's all about the doctrine. And uh, but but uh, you don't fall in love with a doctrine. I mean, some people do love doctrines, but it's yeah, it's not a do. it's not a two way street uh, as a person. But um, but the spirit of God is a person, and and he. You know, I, I say to people, uh, I don't, I've never heard God speak out loud, but I've heard him mm. speak loud and clear a number of times. And mm. uh, and this is what I find with in, in that is that, you know, in the Bible, the first times that God entered into a relationship with people, it, it often was loud. Like the, the Damascus Road experience, it was pretty, you couldn't miss it, right? But that's the only time that ever happened to Paul. I mean, he, he if he if he had a Damascus Road experience every time God spoke, I mean, he'd be walking yeah, he's, around he's blind. He's not getting all the knocked time. off his horse every yeah. thirty <laughs> minutes. Like, you know? That gets no, really awkward, you know. Like God, yeah. I can't handle one more word today. You know, it's like or you know, like a burning bush. Like happens once. Mm. It, he gets Moses' attention, but but what I find is it's it's like being married. Um, you know, when I was. I've been married 39 years. I, I'm I'm just I was just as married on day one as I am 39 years later. But but I tell you what, day one, my wife had to use a lot of words to communicate with me. I mean, you know, stuff yeah. that she thought would be self evident was was not, and she had to explain over and over again what she wanted, what she didn't want. But you know, now 39 years later. Uh, we have a much more mature relationship. It doesn't mean we don't, she doesn't communicate with me. She just doesn't have to use nearly as many words anymore. Uh, right. She just looks at me. I, I just walk in the room and I know I, I'm, she's communicating. So, you know, I think it's wrong to say, yeah, when you're a mature Christian, God doesn't have to communicate anymore. It's, it's kind of the opposite. I, you know, now that I've been a Christian a long time, I know myself way better than I did when I first became a Christian. And I know God way better. And I know how much more I need him than I knew years ago. Uh, but 
now most of the time it's just a sp- still small voice. It's just a, a mm-hmm. prompting here, a little nudge there. That's all it takes. And I'm on my way, you know? And so it's not Damascus road experiences most of the time. Now it's just a little nudge. And I, I just know that nudge. <laughs> I, I know that whisper. And so it's not real dramatic. It's not it's spectacular all the time. Uh, it's just enough to kind of prompt me, okay, say something to this waitress. I, you know, th- this person is, hurting right now. It's a stranger to you, but not to me. And I want you to speak up and, or speak to this Lyft driver, um, and, or just call this person you haven't seen for a while. Just put him on your mind for a reason. Just call. You'll find out why when you, once you call. And I've just had so many times where that's happened that, you know, you you don't want it to be so complex that you sit there paralyzed, like, oh no, what if I get it wrong? What if I don't know the right thing to do? You know, God speak to me, tell me what to do. No, I think, you know, I get up in the morning with an agenda, I get moving, and then God just nudges me this way or that way along the way and just uh, invites me into some things that weren't on my schedule that day. And it's very freeing. You know, it's very freeing. Mm -hmm. I I, I don't want Christians to think, oh, I don't know how to hear God's voice that, you know, I'm going to be a second rate Christian because I don't know that. Most of the time when I sit, if I sit down with a Christian who doesn't think they hear from God, I can ask them half a dozen questions and it becomes obvious. They, God has been speaking to them. They just didn't know that that was his voice. They, you mean like, they're like, oh, that's God? <laughs> I uh, I didn't realize that, you know. I, 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 I'll never forget, I was working with a, a CEO, and he came in, and he was telling his story one time, and he said, Richard, you know, you, you talk about God speaking. He said, it, it, it just doesn't happen for me. He, I, maybe it does for you and your dad, but not mm-hmm. for me. He said, uh, I, I, his, he, was, he led a huge company and they merged with another huge, bigger company. And so he was let go. But he thought, hey, I've got a great resume. I mean, I'll, it won't be hard for me to get another job. So he said, but then he, a, a company approached him that was, uh, uh, did not have the culture that he would, as a Christian, he probably wanted to be associated with. But they paid well. They were a prominent company. So he said, God, if you don't want me to take this job, just close the door, which is a very unbiblical prayer. You know, God, God, God does not promise he'll close every bad opportunity for you. Uh, don't, don't seek God's will that way. You, you need to just know yes or no, not, okay, the door's still open. I guess I'll go through. Um, but he, so he prayed that he said, God, just help, help me. I mean, tell me if I should take this or not. I don't, I, I sort of feel like I shouldn't. So just confirm that for me. But he said, finally, the day came, I had to give my word. I mean, do I take it or not? He said, and I said, God, I asked for help. You didn't give me any. So I said, I, I accepted the job. He said, immediately I realized it was a mistake. It was a very painful exit a few months later. And he said, but Richard, you know, you say God speaks, but why was he signing for me? And so I said, well, um, did you talk to your wife about this? He said, oh yeah, she was against it from the start. Um, but I mean, she's never led any business. She's never led company. And I, I said, well, were you praying with any believers? Were you seeking counsel? Yeah, there's a prayer group I, I'm a part of with some other men. And there, there were a lot of red flags there, but, but none of them lead companies of that size. They don't really know that kind of, you know, that, those kind of dynamics. And I said, well, did you hear anything like a sermon that caught your attention, a quiet time, a, a out of the blue kind of comment? And he said, well, one day my 15-year-old son just out of the blue said, dad, you're not going to take that job, are you? But he said he's 15, he said. And so, I mean, what's funny is we were in a room with a bunch of other CEOs and everyone else in the room is just like, their jaws are dropping. And finally, I just said, so you asked God to guide you and then you rejected every messenger he sent your way. And I'll never forget, it's like the, his eyes just lit up and he, for the first time, realized God had been speaking loud and clear. It just wasn't the voice he was looking for. And so he'd missed mm-hmm. it and he'd made a big mistake. And I've had that happen over and over again where, you know, you don't need to make it up, but it, it, God has a thousand different ways he can send messages to you. And but one, one person asked my dad one time, just flat out, they said, well, what does God's voice sound like? And my dad said, well, my dad's, he's a Canadian <laughs> with a Canadian sense of humor. He said, uh, well, I found that uh, often God's voice sounds an awful lot like my wife's voice. And uh, and, uh, he would say, you know, I hear a lot of men, especially they'll say, well, God, you know, my wife thinks that we should do this, but I haven't heard from God yet. And my dad would say, well, if you're one flesh and God spoke to your wife, guess what? You've just had a message as well. You know, you still need to hear (laughs) from God, but what does one flesh mean if your wife is certain? I, I would take that very seriously. 
you may not understand it right now, but don't don't discard stuff just because God said it to your wife. Wow. <laughs> this is really good. This is really good. Okay, I want to shift gears and touch on a couple more things before we wrap up. Uh, you have written over 30 books yourself. Is that right? Is yeah, that a reasonably he's pushing accurate 40 account? now, getting close. 40. <laughs> yeah. That is a lot of books. Can you yeah. walk us through the writing process, like what that looks like for you? Is that a book a year, roughly? Uh, boy, sometimes it's a couple. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, well, you know, you'd think that I must, that's all I do is write books. But um, but er, I don't know that I have necessarily ever just come up with a book idea. I think pretty well every book has been coming out of uh, either being asked to write a book or, um, or I'm a speaker as well. Like some, you know, you know, this. some people are just writers, but they would never get on a platform and they, and yep. they shouldn't get on a platform. And then there's others who are great speakers, but they can't really, their, their writing, you know, doesn't translate. Um, but yeah. for me, I'm both. And I feel fortunate about that because I'll typically, when I've got to go speak to an audience, I'm praying, I'm researching, I'm thinking, well, what right. God, what, what do these people need? You know, what would be helpful? I don't want to waste their time. And then as you kind of get this message together and you share it, and then people are blown away and they're in tears and mm. they're, you're coming up to the altar and praying. And it's like, wow, God, that was awesome. And, and, you know, every time I share this and I've had people come up and say, have you ever written about this? This is, this is powerful. Um, then, then you sort of get to field test uh, things that seem to really be helpful. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of what my writing has been has, which like, that's what experiencing God was. My dad had taught that for years and watched all kinds of lives change by it. So he knew full well, if it ever gets in print, uh, it, I, I know the impact these truths have. It's going to resonate. Yeah. And so I, I always tell people, if you want to write, don't, if you just want to write a book, you probably shouldn't. You know, mm. if you just want to be an author, um, like I knew a guy one time, he, and he, he had written a number of books, but he told me, he was kind of a bit of a arrogant kind of guy, but he said, yeah, I, my goal is to write two books a year. And, you know, my thought was, well, what if you don't have two books in you a year? You know, mm -hmm. what, what, mm -hmm. what if you don't have two messages? Because uh, I just think you have to really work through that message. It's got to be a life message. And that's why I like, experiencing God's my dad's life message. He's written other books. That was his core life message. And you, you got to have lived it. You got to, I think, field tested the message and and then out of that, eventually you realize, I think there's something here. And then typically a publisher comes and says, we'd love for you to put this in print with us. And, uh, okay, yeah, well, you know, give me a time. And, and I'll tell you, nobody has time to write. You know, you just, you make time to write. I, I finished up a big project at the end of last year. And I'll tell you what, it was so nice over Christmas. I, because when you're writing, like I never have a weekend free. I never have a Sunday. Yeah, it's I, always Sun on your mind. Sunday always afternoon, I would love to have a nap, but I've got to keep writing. Got to, I got to be putting some more pages uh, down. And so when people say I'm too busy to write, I would say, no, it's just not a priority yet. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's a priority, you no, know, I think Rick Warren, what did he get up at like three thirty, four in the morning when he was writing Purpose Driven Life and just wrote every morning till work time and uh, he, just he gotta, actually locked himself in a room. He was telling me, I went out to interview him. He locked himself in a room uh, with no access to the internet. And I don't think he <laughs> ate or shaved or showered until noon. Wow. And he did that day after day for months. Yeah. And he said like the first version, like the first draft was done fairly quickly, mm -hmm. but then it was a constant distillation of, yeah. you know, pages to paragraphs to sentences to words until every word had been edited down to like, okay, there's no extra words in this book, but every word that's there has a purpose. It was crazy. It was just insane. Yeah. And it took and, him and months and like months you, and months. You, you, you hear that and you think, wow, then I want to do that. But it's, you know what I would say though, Karen, I know you have a lot of great leaders that listen to this podcast and I suspect that um, many, many of them have a book in them. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have, don't wait for like a New York Times bestselling kind of, you know, publisher to come to you and offer you a lucrative contract. Today, it's so easy to self-publish, but mm -hmm. I think there's a saying, you probably know this one, it just says when an, an African saying, when an old man dies, a library is lost. Um, I didn't know that. No, I don't, I've never yeah, heard that. That's I've read beautiful. that somewhere. It's like, so all this life experience, all this wow. wisdom you accumulated and experiences and what you reflected on and learned and advice you were given over your life, 
the moment you die, if you haven't written it down anywhere, it's gone. It's just like it, it, it's, mm. it's completely lost. A lifetime wow. of learning, and it's just gone. And so I mm. tell people, if you just write it for your kids and grandkids, um, just take at some point, take some Saturdays, take some vacation time, but 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 put it down in writing. You can publish it so many different ways, um, electronically, whatever else. But there's a lot of people who've done some amazing things. Like you, I, you, I know you've done the same thing. Like you'll meet some pastor no one's ever heard of, but he's got an he has an amazing journey, amazing story, or a business guy that's seen miracles of God. And like I've been enraptured for hours listening to their story. And I'll say, Have you ever written this down? No, no, no. And I got nobody yeah. would want to read that, you know. I would say, Well, your great grandkids might be really inspired by that. And so I just tell people, most people probably have one book in them. And mm. and you're right. It's it's about uh, editing. It's all about editing. Like you know the saying: "There's mm -hmm. no such thing as bad writing, just bad editing." It's or, it's yeah. like good. Like you just you you slap it down on paper, and then you just edit and edit and edit until it finally takes form. And so some manuscripts just take more editing than others. And sometimes I've wished um, that like a book I turned in this last fall. Uh, I, I, I kind of wish I'd had another month or two just to cut some more. I should have probably cut more yeah. out of it, but uh, I, I like your writing. I like your writing style because it's crisp and not real long. It's the right length of book, I think, uh, right now. Um, well, well, thank you. My last book was eight edits, and that's why I'm not working on my next <laughs> book. It was eight drafts, eight rounds of drafts. Wow. And well, it shows. It needed it's very it. Clean. It needed yeah. it. Oh, and you know, people just, it. there's a, it's hard. I tell you what, you can't be insecure and then have your work edited. <laughs> when people start slashing and drawing all these red lines through what you thought were brilliant paragraphs, but it, but you want it to be readable and accessible. And most people listening to this podcast probably have at least one book, their own life message, mm -hmm. at least that if nothing else, their grandkids need to read one day. When an old man dies, a library is lost. Wow. Wow. That, that gives me chills. All right. Yeah. Business leaders, church leaders, you spend a lot of your time coaching business leaders. Yeah. Usually these days, leaders of large Fortune 500 companies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a bit of a recurring theme on the podcast, but I always feel that there's a gap between business leaders and pastors. Yeah. Um, Pastors often feel intimidated by business leaders, but the surprise to pastors is business leaders feel intimidated by pastors, which is weird. Yeah. Uh, I think pastors don't know what to do as a general world with people with success and money. And business leaders often, who may have success and money, feel intimidated because they don't feel like they know God. They didn't go to seminary. They can't read the Bible in the original languages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that gap or maybe you don't see yeah. it? Uh, a lot of people Oh yeah, do see I see it. it for sure. Yeah. I see it for sure. Well, but, tell me what you see. Well, I see pastors often that are not strong leaders. They're uh mm. there's, you know, they've surveyed pastors, senior pastors, and just say are you gifted as a leader? And I mean, the the majority say no. Uh right. they're preachers, they're teachers, uh they're mm -hmm. chaplains, shepherds, uh mm -hmm. shepherds, chaplains. you know, they uh, they're evangelists, uh, but they don't they don't know how to lead. And so then they have some guy who comes in. He's got three thousand employees in the local factory, the biggest employer in that area. And they think, oh, oh, what if this guy comes in and wants to take over the church? What if he he's a very strong, outspoken leader? And I just I don't sure our church can handle a guy like that. And they don't know what to do with them. They feel threatened by them. Mm. And and it's it's a shame because the the churches are filled with uh, business people that could be such a blessing to the church. We, you know, a pastor typically wants them to drop an offering in the offering, you know, but, mm -hmm. but just don't give me your advice. Like, don't give me your skills. And I keep telling pastors, you, I know we want their money, but their skills and entrepreneurial spirit, they, they, their problem solving ability. I mean, they spend all their mm -hmm. time looking at the future and where the trends are going and so many things the church could benefit from. And you, you just want them to drop a check and then just get out of the way and, you know, not voice their opinion. And uh, I, I think we could see revival in the church if churches ever understood how to engage these people. I, uh, you know, I, right. my dad one time met a guy, he, he was in a church of running about a hundred out in Seattle area. And he met a guy at that time, several years ago, was a VP at Boeing Airlines. Mm 
And his job was to, to look at the future, like watch for trends. Mm -hmm. And then when they decide how to spend billions of dollars, they didn't want to invest it in the wrong thing. And so he said, but you go to a church, you're a VP of a very large company and you go to this church running a hundred. What does this church do? Like Boeing is betting billions on you guessing right about the future and trends. So, I mean, here's a church, like <laughs> you think they'd be just picking your brain and saying, where, you know, what should the church be doing to be ready for what's coming? He said, well, he, they let me take a week about every six weeks and with my family and clean the church because we don't have a custodian. And, and I, I pass out bulletins at the back as people come in the auditorium. We said, well, well, like, how do they tap into all that stuff you know that the business values? Well, no, they don't, they don't never ask about any of that. And so, you know, like I watched with COVID coming and all the problems and the shutting down and all that stuff. But, you know, there were a lot of pastors who didn't know how to pivot. I mean, all they knew is all they knew to do mm -hmm. is show up mm -hmm. and preach to the to the people in the pews. And then all of a sudden there was nobody in the pews and they didn't know what to do. But I would say, but, you know, the uh, half my time I spent with business guys going through COVID at the same time, they're right. all pivoting. They're all saying, well, so with this problem, there's got to be possibilities somewhere. Where's the possibilities in COVID? And how do we adapt and, and seize the opportunities that now are there that weren't before COVID? And you'd say, well, you need to go into the church and help the church look for possibilities as well. Where is God at work? And so, but then, you know, these bad, these business guys, they'll, uh, the, the, the main thing I do with these guys, uh, we'll meet in uh, the Dallas Fort Worth airport at the Grand Hyde hotel. Uh, we start at noon on Thursday and go till noon on Friday. And so it's during the work week, the end of the work week. And and these CEOs will fly in from all over the country. The first discipleship I've ever done where people arrived in corporate jets uh, to be discipled. But, <laughs> but, they'll, but they'll say to me, they'll say, you know what? I've never been discipled. No one has ever discipled. And now they'll say I'm embarrassed because I'm put on the board of elders because I'm the richest guy in the church. And, you know, I'm put on the finance committee, but I feel like a fraud because I don't even know how to pray. Don't even know how to seek God. Uh, but I'm in this influential position in my church. And I, now, how do I admit that head of the elders uh, has never been discipled? And so if I were, if I were pastoring today, I, you know, the leadership training we do in the church is usually training oh. people to, to serve in the church. To we do don't tasks. train people mm -hmm. to serve on Monday morning when they get to work. Yeah. We prepare them. Here's, here's Sunday school teacher training so you can do a better job teaching, you know, five-year-old or fifth grade boys at church. But, uh, yeah. But we don't teach them about when you walk in the corporate office on Monday morning, here's how to be a light and salt. And here's some apologetics training. So you know how to, you know, respond to some of the things that they'll be throwing at you. And uh, I, I would, I'd probably map out on a city map where all the office buildings where I had a church member and think, Hey, you know, look at all the different business districts that our church is touching. I wonder if we should start a Bible study at lunchtime in this office building. And I wonder, you know, how we could link with other Christians that are in the same building and, and start a movement. And, you know, I'd be strategizing. I'd be, I'd be helping them. But, but the church is just about, you all come back next Sunday. And it's like, but, 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 but what do we do <laughs> so all true. week? And there's no, so no true. help for what happens during the yeah, week. How'd you like my message? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You missed it. Here's the link. Um, tell me, tell me about um, what you do with those executives when you gather for a day. Like what, what would a curriculum, just broad strokes yeah. look like? What does it mean to disciple them? Well, what in this one, uh, which is the highest level one that we do, uh, hmm. it, it, it lasts three years. And so you come for three years, 10 times all together, three times a year, and then you have a graduation. But we actually had a guy come all the way from Hong Kong uh, 10 times, Hong Kong to Dallas, just to be disciple. Oh, yeah, boy. Um, and so, but we don't teach him how to increase sales. Um, you know, they, <laughs> yeah. they, they don't need us. They, they've mastered that. that. You know? they nailed yeah, they wouldn't yeah. be in the room if they didn't yeah. know how to do that. But, but so we'll spend a whole year just talking about how do you abide in Christ? How do you hear mm. his voice? How do, you, how do you fall in love with God? I know you serve God. Mm -hmm. I know you believe in God, but do you really love him with all your heart and mind? Uh, we'll take a whole year just on their relationship and they'll be antsy because these guys, I mean, literally some of them have flown in on corporate jets and they're, um, they're, they, you know, time is money. And it's like, well, Hey, I, I want to get into the, how do we change the world for Christ here? And we're talking, yeah. you're talking about abiding, about praying. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about. And so, okay, well then year two, now we're going to get into it. We take a whole year just to talk about being conformed, just to be uh, transformed, to be like Christ. It's like you, you, you lead out of who you are. 
and who you are is not like Christ yet. So we're going to help you become more like Jesus. Well, when do we get to the part about where we change the world? That's, I mean, that's what I do all day long is, you know, well, that'll be in year three. Um, but once you know how to walk with God, once you have become like Jesus, now we're ready to talk about, uh, and you know, and it's kind of based on Jesus took maybe three years or so to get the disciples ready. I'm sure Peter was ready on day one to get out there and change the world. And Jesus was saying, no, you, uh, there's a way to do things that's God's way. Uh, you can do the right thing and do it the wrong way. And so, uh, yeah, so we, we, I'll tell you what, by the time you get to the last session that we have with these guys. These are tough guys. I mean, they've been in court, they've been sued, they've had, you know, they've been on the front the on news channels. And uh, and then we we give them a, a few minutes at the end of the, the last session just to share what God taught them over the last three years. I would say 75% of those people break down in tears. They start crying. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you just can't believe it. I mean, you just have to have Kleenexes at every table. It's like, they just, they'll, they'll say, when I walked in the room, I looked around to see what other, you know, competitors or customers were in the room and how we could link up. And I'm, I'm thinking there must be some people here who are going to really need this. And they said, and I wasn't even sure why I was there. And three years later, they'll say, my, I would have lost my marriage if I hadn't been in this class. I had a son that wouldn't even yeah. speak to me. Teenage son, when I first class I came to, my son and I were totally estranged. And he said, now my son just texted me this week. And he actually, one guy read the text and said, um, this is from my teenage son saying, dad, your life has so changed in the last three years. It's given me hope that I can change too. And he just bawling. Wow. And so wow. that we're not, you know, Hey, you go work out your marketing plan on your own. We're going to talk about how you can be like Jesus and see what God's trying to do in your teenage son's life and how you can join him in that. And, uh, I tell you what, it's a lot of fun. You, you wouldn't believe it. You know, you just wouldn't believe it. These high level guys flying around in corporate jets and then you get them just slow them down in front of God's word. And you just start talking about the difference it makes when you walk with God and all, and Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they start sharing these amazing hurts and frustrations and fears that they have. And it's just a safe place for them. They, they, they never had a place like that. And I just wish more churches created those kind of spaces. So people didn't have to fly all the way to Texas to find something like that. Do you have a curriculum or a study guide or anything that would even be like a starter version of what you do that people could could use or purchase? Well, they they this the particular organization that has me do uh, most of their teaching um, kind of keeps that a little bit proprietary, just because Understood. you sort of bro- join the group. But a couple of years ago, my dad and I did write a book called. Uh, was it 45 questions that uh, C- C- Fortune 500 CEOs work? It's, it's called God in the Marketplace mm. is what it's called. God okay. in the Marketplace. And then the subtitle. And basically what we did is we took about 45 of the most common questions that these guys asked. And we just kind of gave what the answer would be that we gave. And so you can get that on like Amazon, whatever, or, or from our ministry. But um, but because we had a lot of people say, well, I don't, I'm a business guy, but I don't do a hundred million dollars of business a year in sales. So I would never qualify to get in that room, but I'd love to know what you tell these guys. And so we did ultimately come up with a book. And so the, the most common questions that we, you know, work through a lot. And, and so I know a lot of business guys who actually use that as a, as a Bible study, they'll meet together and they'll just address one of those questions each week. And, there's some scriptures there, some advice, and then just some questions to talk about, you know, like I, Hey, I, my job's all consuming, but I feel like a failure as a dad, you know, how do I, how do I find a way to not fail at my job, but not fail at home either. And so lots of, lots of issues like that. Okay. So it's called what? God in the marketplace. marketplace. God in the marketplace. Okay. We will link to that in the show notes. So if you're looking for that leaders, you can, you can get it there. I think that's really important. You know, we've got Mark Schultz on who is a professor and uh, released a book. I think it's called, uh, no, that's Gretchen Rubin's happiness project. Anyway, podcast listeners, you'll hear it, but that was a key finding of the book. And I'll talk about that in that interview where they did the longitudinal Harvard study Uh, That's gone on for over 80 years now. And the people who were the most successful professionally often were the most empty relationally. And the people who were the most rich relationally didn't always have 
tremendous worldly success, but we're the most happy people. So hmm. uh, this is great. And you're right. This is sitting there in the chairs, in the pews, week after week after week, and it goes ignored. And I just hope we help break down the intimidation between pastors and business leaders and business leaders and pastors. When I was a pastor, I remember I used to long for Mondays. I mean, Sundays. I mean, Sundays couldn't come fast enough because that was my big day. Yeah. I mean, and I remember Monday morning just being so depressed because I had to wait a whole week till I could get my people back in the building and I could wow them with my next sermon. And and I remember one yeah. week just just so frustrated. And God said, well, <clears throat> go go where they are. And I, I'll never forget, mm. I started making appointments and going and meeting with, and like, hey, do you got time for lunch? You know, I'd love to just drive downtown and just meet you for lunch. And and I had guys, they were like VPs of big companies. And they, they were like, I've never had a pastor ever meet with me. For, I, I've never had a pastor ever mm. come to my office, never walk the shop floor with me. And so I just started doing that. If it was a nurse, I'd walk around the hospital floor with them and whoever they were. And, um, and I, could, I just was blown away that people would say, I've gone to church all my life. My pastor has no idea where I work, what I face. And I'll tell you what, when I would go in and start working on sermons, all of a sudden, I mean, I, I'd seen the temptations in the workplace. I'd seen the the, the stresses mm -hmm. and the the mm -hmm. tough managers and the you know the 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 customers that were chewing them out. And I remember going into a room and this guy, he was just almost weeping. I said, "What's going on?" And and he said, "We just lost a major customer, and it's my job to tell two dozen people that we've laid them off." And he had all these personnel yeah. files on his desk. He said. Every one of them's got a mortgage. They got a family. I've got to choose which ones don't work here anymore. And he said, it's just tearing me up. Well, I'll tell you what, I was thinking that a great sermon series on Habakkuk would just really edify the church at that time. And I'm realizing, you know, I'm, I'm preaching stuff that's really cute for me and really interesting, getting into all the Greek and Hebrew. And my people are dying out there, and I don't even have a clue what to preach about. And so I mm. went out to where they worked, and then I came back and said, now, God, Give me a message for that, for what they're facing there. And it, it revolutionized the way I preached, the way I pastored after I, I got connected with where my people were in the marketplace all week long. Well, there's a lot of women and men who would love to be discipled like that in the marketplace with what they do. And I think you've, you've, you've really issued a great challenge on that. Richard, anything else you want to share? You know, I would just, I, we, my dad and I wrote a book one time on leadership, just called Spiritual Leadership. And the, um, mm. the subtitle was Moving People Onto God's Agenda. And mm. for, for too long, I was always trying to move God onto my agenda. <laughs> I was, it was <laughs> yeah. like, God, yeah, I'm going to start there. this out. I'm gonna, I really want to get my organization to this level. And I really appreciate if you'd bless it and send us funding. And I tell you what, it was revolutionary when I realized that's not the Christian life. The Christian life is you get on God's agenda. And when I look at this world today, it is such a mess. There are so many problems. And what I realized is God, th th this world does not need my best. It needs God's best. And for too long, I've been robbing my family, uh, my colleagues, by trying to give them my best, and they needed more than that. And so I would just want to issue a challenge to your listeners to say, uh, hey, I, I assume you're trying to do the best you can, but people need yeah. the best God can. And for that, you need to change your focus. And instead of saying, well, what can I do? I would ask, what is God doing? And how do I get, how do I jump on that, that wagon and go with him and become a part of that? I'm, I, you get to a certain age and just fulfilling your dream might not be enough. Uh, I want to, before I die, <laughs> yeah. I want to be, I want to be able to point to something and say, that was a God thing. That's something only God could have done, and I got to be a part of it. And that might be the most exciting, life-changing, rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. And so this is a, I think this is just a time when I think God's looking for people who are willing to surrender their agendas and get onto His. And uh, I think the world will feel the impact if we do. It's a great place to close. Uh, well, where can people find you and your work online these days, Richard? Well, we've got a ministry website, Blackaby Ministries International, just at blackaby.org. And uh, I've got a podcast. I've got a Richard Blackaby mm -hmm. a blog site. I got, I'm on social media and Twitter, Facebook, and so on. And so you can, 
it's not hard to find me somewhere. <laughs> but and you uh, do a ton of book reviews too. Yeah, I reviews, review some you of yours. I really, I really Thank appreciate you. your material. It's great. So I, I highly recommend. Uh, in fact, I think my son-in-law and daughter are are taking uh, your book just on all the zones and stuff, and just they've got oh two, at your best at yeah. your best that, that one that went through eight drafts. Yeah, they, they've got two <laughs> kids, three and under, and they uh, oh. they need they need that right now. So they're they're uh, in it. They're in they're it. grateful for your wisdom on that. Wow. Thank you. It's, it's out of, as you've hinted, all of my mistakes, we got a little <laughs> kernel of truth here and there. Uh, Richard, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time today and uh, grateful for your willingness to have the conversation. Oh, thanks. It's great to be with you, Carrie. There's a new movement happening in the country to reclaim the promise of Jesus's unconditional love and grace and to see his church rise above the culture war. He gets us, hopes to give it a voice. The biggest faith campaign in history, He Gets Us invites a rapidly growing audience, from spiritual explorers to like-minded Christians, to reconsider the radical life of Jesus. Whether people believe Jesus was God or just a man, they're invited to consider His example for themselves.